Um, so I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. Um, just a little bit of, um, about Ernie. Ernie is uh, Bikani. I'm Skapi Bikani and um, grew up in the boarding school area. And he's been the longest staff member at um, All Nations Health Center, even before I started 15 years ago. And I first met Ernie, he was my squad boss. So um, we had a really long standing fire program at Missoula Indian Center when it was Missoula Indian Center. And that's how I met Ernie. And that's how I came to the All Nations Health Center. And so I'm just so happy Ernie is just so awesome and he's one of our elders in our community in Missoula and I just really appreciate that uh, joining us tonight so welcome Ernie. Thank you. Okay now start. Yep. Okay. This story comes from Rocky Boy Montana. I forget what day, year it was, but I was with my wife, Norma Standing Rock, down there. We stayed with her dad and mom and her brothers and sisters. And it, uh, we got, me and my brother-in-law, Keith Standing Rock, we kind of thought about earning some money, so, he had a big white truck and a full trailer. And we thought, well, let's go make some money. We'll go cut some posts and poles. Well, poles mostly. He said, okay, so we we went up and we hauled that that um, trailer behind us. And we went up in the mountains by in Rocky Boy. And there's a mountain they call Baldy Butte. And we were right this on the side of it. And uh, that's where we pulled it, the camper, and we unloaded it, set it down, and we unloaded it. Then we start, start our chainsaws up. And before that, you know, we always pray to take things from Mother Earth. So that's what we did. Then we start cutting poles. They, they were about maybe 12 by six, right around there. And um, we cut all day. We're stacking them, limbing them, getting them ready for, to haul down to Haver to sell them. And so he, at the end of the day, I stayed up there and he went into town, I mean, in, back home. And I stayed up there, I had a big cannabis to cover the back end of the, the, the little trailer we pulled up there. I, that I slept in there. And um, we, I ate, just said my prayers and lit my sweet grass and I was ready for bed. So it was getting, it was night. And so I covered that, covered me up with that tarp and I was laying there just thinking of what was going to happen tomorrow, where we were going to go right there or finish cutting there. And uh, next thing I, it was just quiet, really quiet up there. The next thing I, I heard, I heard some hooting like an owl. That hooting is far away. And it started getting closer. And I could hear the flapping of the wings getting louder. Really getting louder. And I was parked right underneath a great big tree by that in that camper. 
then it, these wings got so loud and it's hooting owl. It landed right in the tree above me, right up there. And I was just, I start praying again. And uh, it just, it got quiet. Then in a little while when I was praying, I heard the screeching, the, the sound of an eagle way far away, but the same place that owl started. And it's the screeching got louder, louder, and the flapping got louder and louder. And next thing I heard this, where the owl was sitting up there, it just hooted and it flied away. I don't know which direction it went, but then I heard this great big flapping of wings. The eagle, I could, I could hear him. And he landed right in the same place as that, that owl was above me. And I just start praying. I start thanking the eagle spirit where I thought I was, I was being protected for some reason. <coughs> the next thing I was praying and I lit my sweet grass again. The next thing this, we heard the flapping, the eagle took off. I could hear it flapping, flapping and getting dimmer and dimmer as it went. I felt really safe. Really safe, I felt. And I said prayers again and I went to sleep. Next thing I woke up early in the morning and we, I got up and my brother-in-law Keith came up and I talked to him about what happened. And so he, we said, well, let's pray and Let's pray and we'll start working again. So we did. And so we got done praying and we ate. Then we went up, walked up a little ways to the where those posted poles were good poles were. And we start cutting. He was on the one side and I was on the other side. And we start cutting our chainsaws, trees. And for a while, then I'd limb them. Then I start cutting this other one. And you know, as you're cutting, twigs fall down. So you gotta watch them from the top to, and I was leaning against it, cutting it. And I looked up, oh my goodness. There was a big eagle right above that tree. It was just, hovering just like that way looking down at me just above that tree a little ways up his head was turning and looking at me and I grabbed that pole that tree pole and I start praying I start praying and I looked up like that way and he's, he was still there and as if he was saying I, I am here for you you're okay. Then he took off. I watched him as he flew down where I was, the big hill there. And he went east, right towards Baldy Butte. And I always wondered why they called it Baldy Butte. So I thought, well, I'm, since the eagle went that way, I'm going to go that way, follow him. And so, I put my chainsaw down and I walked. I walked up that hill mountain and over. 
then where, where, where they call it Baldy Butte. It's the perfect head of a bald eagle. You could see the white feathers around his neck that way, the whole mound. And he was facing east. And oh, I was just amazed and I started praying again, thanking the creator for what I saw and what I experienced and that I was safe where I was. And it was an amazing thing that really happened to me that time. I'll never forget that ever. I'll always think of them. The Standing Rock family, that was my family. And they still are today. And I love them like my mom and dad, and my sisters and brothers. And that's, that's how this story came to be. And I'll always say, thank you, Creator, for what I have experienced and what I've seen and what I've heard. And I feel safe, I feel protected. And I am in your hands. Do with me what you want. I'll answer and obey you from this time on. Anya. Hey. Okay. I think they're also talking. Mm. Ask if they have any questions. You have any questions? Anybody? Might take a few minutes because they type it. I don't know. Thank you for sharing. You're more than welcome. I have another story I'll say one of these days. This happened when I was a kid living in Cut Bank Creek. And this is a true story also that I experienced. If you want, your name no ah. if you want to share, we have a couple more. We have more minutes. Okay, I'll tell that one. Yeah, we have however long you want. Okay, I'll tell a story when I was a kid then. Okay, it was, it was in the 50s, late 50s, I'm sure, early 60s. I was staying with my aunt and uncle, Joe and QP Old Chief. And we stayed in Brown and, but then his, Sister uh, Nancy, young Nancy Young Running Crane, that was Sam Running Crane's wife, and his sons Lloyd, Everett, and Gloria. We all stayed down the bottom by his house. The place we stayed and we cleaned it out. It was a chicken coop. We all cleaned it out, all us kids and Joe and Cupy. And we made it into a little, little house. There was about nine of us that stayed in there. Anyway, we used to go play stick game with uh, Joseph's mother, Rosie, and Isabel, and Nancy. We all stayed down there. Boy, old chief, David, Gloria, all of us kids. We all stayed down there and we all played stick game at nighttime by the river. And we'd sing, sing good songs and we'd play stick game. And that one night we were down there. All of us, we were down there at nighttime. And that 
Rosie, she said, all you kids stand up and walk. We're gonna go to the house. And she said, don't look back, just follow me. And as curious as kids were, we turned around and looked back. And what we saw, these white, white things off of the ground about two feet floating up towards us. There's about maybe three of them floating up towards us. As we was walking, she said, follow me. Well, we're going back to the house. So we went, went up to Sam Rennie Crane's house. We all went in there, everybody we stayed. And she said, duck your heads and don't look at the windows. And a lot of us were crying. We, we never experienced anything like that. And we, she said, don't look up, don't look at any windows. And like I say, curiosity, I peeked up by the window and this window was must have been about 12 feet high. And what I saw in that corner of the window was very scary looking. It wasn't white, it was green. And its eyes are so close together and then had the hood on. Then I closed my eyes again and looked down and some of the kids looked up and saw it also. Then we, Rosie, would she was <laughs> praying and praying and all of us. Then she said, okay, it's whatever is out there is gone. So we walked outside we were looking around and up on top of that hill, way up there, we saw some of these three things floating from the road up there. They were floating right up to that hill, all the way up there. And then they disappeared. My grandpa Sam Cutfinger was there too. He saw everything. And that's another, from what I understand now, we disturbed uh, the people in the spirit world. They didn't hurt us or anything. I'm sure they just wanted to let us know that we were there and that we were protected. There was nothing scary about it after that, but at the time it was, and that's a, a true story. So my sisters are still, they still remember that story. Some of them are gone. And the running crane family, Sam and his wife and his kids, they're all gone. God rest their soul in the spirit world. And my Uncle Joseph and QP, they're gone. And I pray every night for them that they be safe in heaven for all our answer star. And I thank you for letting me take this time to share these stories with you. They come from my heart. I would never lie about this. I followed the creator. I'm in his hands now. I do what he needs me to do. Hanya. Okay. Thank you so much, Ernie, for those stories. Yeah, our stories are powerful. Our our people are very powerful. Our our spirits are, you know, ancestors on the other side. They're in a sacred place. So I that's awesome. I think I remember you telling me that story when we were out on a fire. I probably did a long time ago, yeah. So I just stuck close with you. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting though. It was it was a something I'll never forget ever. It was 
pretty much all all us was down there. Then pretty much they're we're all they're all gone. Mm. A handful of us left, I think. And we we always remember that that was our home. That was our fishing. And every time we needed something to eat, Auntie Cupid said, "Bernie, you and Dusty." We'll get us some fish we're going to eat and pick some strawberries. We pick choke cherries, raspberries, caught fish. We were happy we had dinner. Yeah. Mm. Every time we had commodities, my sisters would say, let's go have a picnic. They'd cut up the chopped meat and the cheese and make sandwiches. And we'd just go up above us where the hill was and we'd just sit up there. And it was like a cafe. Yeah, mm. <laughs> Commodities kept us a going at that time, and today they still do. Mm. Very appreciated. I, I remember when I used to have uh, powwows out there, and it was so nice, and they'd have powwows oh. at that gym, and yeah, that was a good old days, and I'm gonna live to see more of them. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Dana, for having me here. And Ray. Thank you so much, Ernie. We yes. just appreciate it. And Ray, we have a gift for you. Ah. Oy. Thank you. Take it out and show everybody. Oy. I just bought my brother a blanket now. He just got it at the mail. He said, I'm going to sleep warm tonight. It's a, it's a Chicago Bears blanket. He is, yeah. Oh, I'm going to sleep warm tonight, too. Just going right on my bed. Thank you, guys. Oh, this is neat. This is cool. So, yeah, it's an eighth generation blanket, and the artist is John Pepin, who is Itani, too. Oh. Ah, okay. Oh. So Ernie, thank you for being our elder. Thank you for being our elder in Missoula. You know, like time just flies and all of a sudden you're an elder. Yeah. Oh, I remember when I first started working, I just did my 50, I think. Now I'm 72. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Ernie. And, uh, is, I, let me just read, there's a couple things in the chat. Wow, power, powerful stories gave me goosebumps. And thank you, loved hearing the memories from childhood. Ah, uh, brings back good memories right here. And yeah, okay. Thank you guys for having me here and I'll be glad to do it again sometime. Thank All you, right. Ernie. Hey, Ernie, I got a question for you. Yeah. It's Thomas McClure. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, how much did you, uh, how much would a set of poles go for back in the day? Oh, today I couldn't remember, but I think we, we must have got about a hundred, maybe a hundred and twenty-five dollars for about, oh, 50 poles. Wow. That wasn't much, but it, it paid it fed us, you know. It was it was fun being out in the woods though, really. That's what really really did it was out there doing work and bringing home a little money for the family. Yeah. Now I imagine they're worth more than that now to this day. That's been about holy. 40 years ago or so, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people in, uh, I know this side of the state will pay about 300 bucks for a set. Does that sound about right, Dana? Um, some people, I know you can cut poles here and then they'll drive down to Wyoming or some, or some places where, you know, the poles just aren't as plentiful and you can get shiny little penny for that. 
Oh, yeah. I think that's the going right now is about, you know, I think 300 if you peel them. Yeah, we, we peeled them and everything there. It was a lot of work, but we, we could see, we, we thought it was good price at that time too, you know, and it was, we just bought groceries, yeah. Right. Yes. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Tom. See you again. You bet. Uh,